Hello everyone and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Today, doing something a little bit different. I am going to be reviewing a video that I made on the 12th of April, 2019. Uh, this happens to be the, I think the second most viewed video ever on my channel, for whatever reason, I'm not really sure why. But the premise of that video was I was going to be taking a look five years into the future at the 2024 season and predict the best 10 players of the competition. So it has been four and a half years since I made that video. And uh, as we approach the 2024 season, obviously it is a little bit early, I'm gonna review exactly how good my predictions were in that video. Obviously it's a little bit of speculation. You, should, you could argue that I should do this at the end of 2024, but eh. Off-season content, baby. So the format for this video will be I will roll the clip from that video back in 2019 and then I will respond to each prediction. It looks like I've predicted the 10 best players in descending order, which means we'll start with the player that I thought was going to be the 10th best player in the competition. Before I roll the clip, if you could do me a favor, subscribe to the channel. Thank you. Kicking off our top 10 is GWS's Tim Taranto. Given the production line of talent that has been the GWS midfield in recent years, I think it has been overlooked just how good Tim Taranto is for a 21 year old player. Standing at 187 centimeters and 87 kilos, Taranto possesses the perfect blend of athleticism and footy now that could potentially make him one of the best midfielders in the game. Taranto is averaging nearly 27 possessions a game so far in 2019 and looms as an important player both in the immediate and long-term future of the Giants. Okay, so the player that I had in 10th was Tim Taranto. This one was an interesting one. Obviously, he uh, was with the GWS Giants back then. I suppose it wasn't that long ago he left, but not an absolutely horrible call. I think he's comfortably not in the best 10 players of the competition, but he did have a very good year this year. and It was a bit of a bold call. He would really kick into gear that year and has been a pretty good player there since then. His first year at Richmond was pretty damn good, but you could argue, was he in the top 10 players on form this year? He's probably borderline. He polled pretty well on the brown low. Missed out on all Australian though, if I'm not mistaken. I'd say this was an okay call. It's not absolutely horrendous, uh, but I'll be surprised if he is genuinely in the top 10 players of the competition next year. At number nine, we have selected Bulldog Aaron Norton. Norton was selected with pick five in the 2017 draft and was projected to be a Jeremy McGovern-like defensive talent. Even those with the biggest raps on him, however, likely didn't expect that he would be good enough to finish top five in the Bulldogs' best and fairest in just his first season. As an elite intercept marking key back that has shown an ability to drift forward and contribute, I believe Norton is the best talent in his position across the league. So Aaron Norton as the ninth best player in the competition, definitely kind of overrated him there. But again, we are projecting into 2024. The idea that Aaron Norton could be an all Australian key forward next year is not absolutely ludicrous. He's not in the 10th best players in the competition right now. In fact, you know, the key forwards you'd have ahead of him right now, you have Jeremy Cameron, Charlie Kerno, Larky, Oscar Allen, Taylor Walker. But I do think there's some, some genuine potential there for Norton to bob up and be an all Australian. Is he likely to be a top 10 player of the competition by this time next year? I would have thought not really. Ranked at number eight is another GWS giant, full forward Jeremy Cameron. Jeremy Cameron burst onto the AFL scene in 2012, and when he managed an incredible 62 goals in just his second season at the level, many thought he was set to become a great of our game. He's put up respectable numbers since, scoring over 45 goals in each of the past four seasons, but nonetheless stopped short of becoming the incredible forward he has the potential to be. So far in 2019, he leads the Coleman Medal Award, and I think his form is here to stay. In 2024, he'll be turning 31 years old, but he could follow the Kennedy and Franklin example and remain the best key forward in the game. Aha, so Jeremy Cameron I have is as the eighth best player in the competition, but uh, also the number one ranked key forward in the competition. So this one's not too bad. I actually underrated Jeremy Cameron. I think he deserves to be higher in the rankings of players in the league right now. Again, he wasn't a massively established player. Like he was an established gun at AFL level back then, but uh, I think he's won his Coleman since then. And obviously still playing pretty good football. He started 2023 as probably the best player in the competition in the opening month. So I'm right in that he's in the top 10. I probably slightly underrated him to be honest. In seventh spot is Sydney's young superstar Isaac Heaney. Heaney is already such a prominent gun for the Swans that it may be easy to forget that he's just 22 years of age, with a lot of football in front of him still. Heaney is equally damaging as a high-flying goal-scoring forward or a smooth-moving midfielder. In time, it is expected he will spend increased minutes as an on-baller, but his ability to excel in multiple positions make him an incredibly dangerous player. Okay, so I went with Isaac Heaney as the seventh best player in the competition. I think this one is a fair way off the mark. Heaney is a gun. Let's give him his due respect. I think, uh, you know, 2022, he was better than 2023 for sure. He kind of uh, didn't quite reach expectations in 23 naturally. I see the raw potential with him there, the, to the potential to be an absolute gun of the competition. I would say he hasn't ever been a top 10 player in the competition generally. And I do think 
Isaac Heaney's best football is still ahead of him. I think he'll have a career where he, he's still good into his late 20s. But if we're comparing him against, say, what's a player of similar position um, and type, you know, a Toby Green, Toby Green would be in the best 10 players of the competition. Isaac Heaney's a fair bit behind him, I would say. So overrated Isaac Heaney here. Ranked fifth is Melbourne's Clayton Oliver. Oliver has made such an impressions in his first three seasons of footy that club legend Gary Lyon has suggested he may be their greatest ever midfielder. So far in 2019, Oliver is averaging over 32 possessions a game, and incredibly, he remains several months shy of his 22nd birthday. In that Melbourne side stacked with talent, it is quite possible that he could have a Brownlow medal and a Premiership medallion within five years' time. In six, I've got Clayton Oliver. You know what? I'm pretty happy with that. That's pretty solid. When I recorded this video, this would have been the start of Clayton Oliver's fourth season in the competition. We all knew he was a gun, but he still hadn't quite proven it at AFL level yet. So to have him as the sixth best player in the competition, I don't think that's too far off what will be the case in 2024. Sure, 2023 wasn't a, a fantastic season for him, but uh, a lot of that's down to injury, and then, of course, he was going through some personal stuff. But I do think on his day, fully fit, uh, there, there is a top five midfielder in the competition in there. So I'd say this one was a pretty reasonable call. Cracking the top five is Collingwood's Brody Grundy. Grundy is already arguably the greatest ruckman in the game, and it's easy to forget he hasn't even turned 25 yet. The South Australian averaged an incredible 20 possessions and 40 hitouts a game last year, as his side narrowly missed out on the Premiership. There is still a lot of football left in Brody Grundy. Aha, Brody Grundy back in 2019 was uh, pretty much the best ruckman in the competition, up there with Max Gorn. I can't remember exactly, but my logic was that Brody Grundy was only 24 when I recorded this video, and the trajectory that he appeared to be on, and the fact that Ruckmen tend to peak later in their careers. I really thought we were going to see a player like Brody Grundy that would potentially be a generational Ruckman. But, you know, towards the back end of his career at Collingwood, he fell away, wasn't picked in his final year, gets traded to Melbourne, falls behind as the second Ruck, is now traded to Sydney. I remain optimistic that Brody Grundy can return to some much better form as the number one Ruck at the Sydney Swans. But to say he's a top five player in the competition next year would be, yeah, laughable. In fourth spot, I have another magpie in Jordan Dugowie. It's probably in the last 12 months that Dugowie has truly shot to prominence after he bagged an impressive 48 goals in the 2018 season. Although he was originally drafted as a midfielder, Dugowie has settled on a niche as a leading forward in an established Collingwood lineup stacked with midfield talent. It remains to be seen whether the young gun will ever fully transition into the midfield, but given his prodigious talent as a forward and the plethora of midfield options at the pies, he may not necessarily need to. Dugowie gets a big boost in ratings for me on the basis of his ability to turn it on in massive occasions. He truly is a big game player. So, Jordan Dugowie as the fourth best player in the competition. Um, yeah, probably not quite right. Don't get me wrong, Jordan Dugowie is a gun. He's now a premiership player and a hugely important player to that premiership team now as well, playing more midfield time than ever. Still dangerous, big game player, absolute gun. Uh, but is he in the top four players in the competition? Probably not. So I slightly overcooked this one. But again, you know, fast forward 12 months, uh, it's not the craziest suggestion ever that Jordan Dugowie could win a brown low. So he's kind of in the mix. In third spot is Josh Kelly from the GWS Giants. Drafted with pick two in the 2013 draft, the 24-year-old has put together over 100 impressive games for the Giants as a hard-running, evasive midfielder with elite kicking skills. His last full season for the Giants was in 2017, in which he earned 21 Brownlow votes. Provided he can stay fit, I think it is likely he will win the medal himself one day. Securing his signature could be the most important variable in GWS's medium-term success. Ah, uh, yes, I remember now. This was kind of an era where we thought Kelly, Bont, and Cripps were going to be uh, the absolute big three of the competition. Now, Josh Kelly is still a pretty damn good player and on his day, a genuine A grader. Probably hasn't had the consistency over the course of his career to really entrench himself anywhere near being the third best player in the competition, but a hugely important player to the Giants. Not quite a top 10 player, let alone top three, uh, but still a very good player. Making number two on the list is Carlton superstar Pat Cripps. Cripps is another player that is such an established star at AFL level already that it's incredible to think about how much of his career is still in front of him. In terms of his playing style, Cripps is an unprecedented player in the AFL, playing as an inside midfielder at a gigantic 196 centimetres. Cripps takes the term contested beast to a whole new level, breaking the record for contested possessions in a season in 2018. Impressively, Cripps amassed 20 Brownlow votes last year in a side that won just two games for the year. While he's probably close to his ceiling in terms of fulfilling his talent, he's still good enough to rank number two on my list. 
Uh, Patrick Cripps, the trajectory that he appeared to be on back then uh, was astronomical. Absolute gun player of the competition and seemed destined for a Brownlow medal, which of course he's won. It's just that he's been a little bit up and down since then. So where does he rank in the players of the competition? Still pole well in the Brownlow in 2023, obviously won it in 2022. He's not the second best player in the competition, but he's going to be around about the mark for top 10. It's just that he's not quite as consistent as uh, the players you'd have in your top handful of players of the competition. Ranking first on the list is Bulldog Marcus Bonton. Pelly. Like Cripps, Bontempelli is an unusually large midfielder standing at 193 centimetres. But what sets Bont apart is his combination of athleticism, footy smarts and skill. The Bont spent much of 2018 splitting his time equally between the forward line and midfield and probably didn't have the same impact as he's had in previous years. In 2019, he's taken his game to another level so far, averaging nearly 30 possessions a game. One of Bontempelli's key strengths is his versatility, with the potential to be a frontline midfielder, a forward target or even play a role behind the ball. His rare mix of attributes are what earns him the rank of number one on this list, as I believe he has the most upside of any of these candidates. Ah, saving the best for last. Marcus Bontempelli is the best player in the competition. I'm going to double down on that. This is my personal opinion. I think you could throw uh, a bunch of different names in the hat. But for me, I think the tools that this guy has and the consistency and leadership and his balance between inside out and forward. Honestly, it's just, it's it's kind of a crime that he doesn't have a Brownlow medal yet. I, I'm a huge fan of Marcus Bontempelli and I will say that him being the best player in the competition is a pretty good prediction. I'm very happy with that. And to be honest, he'd probably be the one I would rank number one. Okay, so instead of giving any more uh, back patting, there's going to be a, a number of players that should have made this list that didn't. So we'll go through a few of those. First of all, Nick Dacos. It's hard to really blame me for that because back in April 2019, I wouldn't have even known this kid existed, but who would have thought as well that in his second season, he'd be in the top echelon of players. So there will be some people out there that have Nick Dacos, the very best player in the competition. I'm probably not quite there yet. I'm still a Bont man, but he's in the top handful. I'll list some other players that are still probably in the top 10 players of the competition. Charlie Kerno is probably in the top handful. I didn't even mention him in this video. I think back then he seemed a little bit more speculative to me. And I remember when he was first drafted, there was a little bit of talk, you know, he's an undersized key forward, or is he going to potentially play in the midfield? I remember some of the conjecture around that. I didn't see him becoming, you know, the best key forward in the competition. So Charlie Kerno absolutely should have made this list. Uh, Taylor Walker is probably still in the top 10 players of the competition considering his late career form. That was that one's hard to predict. Completely omitted Zach Butters and Connor Rosie. I've always been big on those players, but I didn't rate them as highly as the guys I did include in those, this video. And I got that wrong. Both of those players are top 10 players of the competition right now, and I'd expect them to be in 2024 as well. I'll shout out Sam Taylor as well, drafted in the second round of 2017 and become one of the best key defenders in the league. So is Harris Andrews, another player that should have made this list as well. You could even include Dusty Martin. Uh, again, I was a little bit ageist, I think, with this video. You know, guys like Taylor Walker and Dustin Martin, for instance, could have made this list. Dusty actually did have a very good year this year. Would I include him in my top 10? It's borderline because if he gets later in his career, he's playing more of a forward role, but I don't know if he if he played as a full-time midfielder, would he still be a top 10 player of the comp? He probably would. So that one's iffy, uh, but those are some of the biggest names that I missed. But upon reflection, I'm pretty happy with the calls of Marcus Bontempelli. Patrick Cripps is not a terrible call, but again, probably an easy one to make, so I probably can't give myself too much credit for that. Clayton Oliver, Jerry Jeremy Cameron, um, solid calls to be in my top 10. And Tim Taranto is a bit of an iffy one because he's probably in the teens. But this list could have been so much worse. I could have taken some big leaps, got a few of them wrong, um, but none of the players that I mentioned are horrible footballers. So the three that I will say were bad calls were Brody Grundy. Um, again, that one's kind of him falling off the rails a little bit in terms of the trajectory of his career. Isaac Heaney was a little bit too big on, even if he does fulfill his potential. It's hard to see him leapfrogging some of these players. Sorry, Toby Green not being in the top 10 is also a big miss. I should have mentioned that. Toby Green is absolutely a top 10 player of the competition. And I was a little bit too big on Aaron Norton. There are some other key forwards of the comp uh, around his age that have probably gone past him. I mean, I had Jeremy Cameron higher, but you know, there's also Kerno, um, Nick Larkey, Oscar Allen at, on current form are better forwards. Before I wrap up the video as well, I'll, I'll go through some of the the common names that were thrown up in the comments section of that video and you can go back and check for yourself. I didn't go any, like deeply analyze it, but some of the names that popped up as players that I should have had at the time, uh, Tim Kelly was one of them. He was of course still at Geelong. Zach Merritt was a common one and that's a pretty good call. He's maybe not quite top 10, but he's been consistently around that sort of 
teens mark, I would say, for a number of years now. Andrew McGrath was a very popular pick. I wouldn't say he's anywhere near it. Sam Walsh also should have made this list, actually, now that I think about it. And that was another common one in the comments. Again, Sam Walsh, probably not a top 10 player in terms of season 2023, but by 2024, he could totally win the brown low. Some other interesting ones were Hugh McCluggage. I got uh, I got a bit of hassle for not having him. Jack McRae was another one. He was a gun player uh, for a number of years there and hasn't quite hit those heights since. Uh, there was a, some criticism for Bontepelli over Cripps. I will double down on that. I still, I still think it's Bontempelli. Butters and Rosie was one that I got criticized for. That's completely correct. You, you guys were right who said that. Jack Higgins was another popular commented name. James Warple. Jade Gresham got a number of mentions by people as well. And uh, funnily enough, Jacob Townsend. I'm not sure if that one was a joke. I only saw one comment for Charlie Kerno. So props to whoever said that. That, uh, that was a great call by you. Anyway, guys, thought that video would be a little bit of fun. Um, let me know in the comments what you thought of my assessments. Again, this is all arbitrary and subjective, so um, who really knows? But I'm thinking of working on one for 2029. In fact, I've already started on it. So as always, I appreciate you watching the content. Uh, let me know in the comments any ideas for videos like this that you want me to do. Maybe like future ladder predictions. God, that's a, that's a recipe for embarrassment for sure. But that's what I'm here for. Why not? So thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.